I'm Dr. Cassie from NABC's Vetfolio and the host of Vet to Vet. With the rising popularity of brachycephalic dog breeds, every practice needs all the brachy care information they can get their hands on. They often have multiple medical issues and it can be complicated trying to manage all of these comorbidities. So today we're talking specifically about eyes and some helpful guidelines for busy practices managing brachycephalic patients. We have two guests with us today, both with extensive veterinary ophthalmology knowledge, Dr. Terry McCullough and Dr. Marnie Ford. Dr. Ford, Dr. McCullough, thank you so much for joining me. Can you tell us a little about yourselves? Um, yes. Um, uh, I practiced for um, about 19 years in my own solo practice, but total, I've been an ophthalmologist for 37 years. Wow. Yep, and I'm practicing out of Vancouver and also out of the University of Guelph, and I've been practicing for 23 years. So combined... 60 years. 60 years. Goodness. Well, I think <laughs> that definitely speaks to some credibility here in this lecture. So with that in mind, um, Dr. Ford, I understand that you recently wrote an article about ocular disease and brachycephalics. And kind of with that article in mind, can you offer some tips on how we can communicate with pet owners about the risk of ocular disease in their pet and you know how to be proactive in recognizing and implementing treatment early? Sure. I think it's really important to educate vet owners using simple and non-technical language. Um, we need to educate them about the risks of these diseases in this, these breeds, as well as promoting proactive care. So I typically try to touch on six different points. As far as the risks of ocular disease associated with brachycephalic animals, they do have a unique anatomy, and that's related to their very shallow orbits and their very shortened maxilla. And so the consequence of having a basically a squished up little face is the orbits themselves become shallow. So there's very, there's very little actually holding the eyeball to the head. The eye is actually being held on really by the eyelids. Um, in addition to that, they have a reduced cor corneal sensitivity. And then with the very shortened maxilla, you end up with nasal folds of skin because the skin is all the same length, whether it's a long-nosed dog or a short-nosed dog. And when they're shortened, all that hair has to roll up somewhere, so it becomes the nasal folds. You also end up with these big rounded eyelids, and as a consequence to that, the eyelid margins are often rolled in. That's called entropion. So all of these factors not only increase the actual exposure of the cornea, but the damage that's incurred from things rubbing on them as well. The second point I like to bring up with people is to make them aware of what the common conditions are that we see with brachycephalic breeds. So this would include third eyelid gland prolapses, dry eye is a big one, um, and then corneal ulcers. These are all really common aspects of a brachycephalic breed. Um, I stress heavily that we need to be doing frequent monitoring of our patients and not just from the vets. I think the owners need to be aware of what the clinical signs are. So they need to do daily monitoring. They need to make sure that the pigment that they're seeing is, diff is either increasing or probably not decreasing. Um, and to be aware of their environments. And then at your wellness checks that they do at the clinics, that's where trends come in. You can't be a magician and know that this is now a new problem. You're looking at trends in tear production that have redu reduced, or you're looking at trends in how much pigment is being deposited onto the corneas. So those would be the three most important things. Um, we do like to talk about treatment, mitigation of problems, and also preventative problems. So if they need surgical reconfirmation of their eyelids, then we would do some you know, medial plastic surgeries just to help reduce the irritation to the corneas. Um, safety is something we talk about with owners on the first visit. What's their environment like, other pets, um, handling, neck pressure, that kind of thing. And then also you really do want to encourage questions from these owners. You want to make sure that they feel comfortable being able to come to you with questions that don't seem to, they may seem dumb to them, but in fact they're, they're very good questions to ask about these breeds. I have so many more questions now. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, first one is with these, you know, that's not a comforting feeling that the eyes are being held in by the eyelids, although I think we've all experienced that that is the case. Um, do most brachycephalics have a complete blink? No. Okay. In fact, most of them do not have a complete blink. Um, the problem with these gigantic, rounded, beautiful, baby-like faces that we're all attracted to, that's the impetus for buying these dogs for the most part, is unfortunately the rounded eyelid doesn't typically blink fully. It's, it's not common to blink fully. Plus they're trying to blink over top of this prominent eye. And so you can imagine how there's this intrapalpebral space of dryness that's just always exposed to right. the environment. Yeah. 
Is that where a lot of the pigment, you know, when you mentioned like monitoring the pigment at home and, and watching that, um, I guess I'm assuming, you know, from this keratitis that I, I would result mm -hmm. from not having a complete blink and, and this type of exposure, uh, should we be doing things like, like keeping photographs of exams or like doing serial Schirmer tear tests at the exams? 100%. I think photographing is perfect because it's, it's really, really easy to not think that pigment is progressing when in fact you look back at photos and you go, huh, geez, two years ago he looked really different. Sure. Now he's really pigmented. Um, absolutely. And then also, I like this is why I like monitoring for trends. So you're checking their tear film, you're checking the tear production, and you're saying, huh, the last three years he's been sort of hovering at one, one number and now he's kind of trickling down. That would be the time to get onto it proactively and start dealing with these tear production. So cornea is skin. It's the same tissue, the collagen is laid differently. And so just like your skin, if you were to rub it every day in the same spot all the time, it's going to become brown and thickened, get more blood vessels. Cornea is just doing what it thinks it needs to do to protect itself, and so it develops pigment. The problem is, is that that's not really conducive to vision. Right. 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 So it's a tricky tissue. It is a tricky tissue. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I'm so glad that we, we have you know, our, our talk that we've done previously where we talked about, you know, qualitative tear film and, um, and these types of things and, and proactive treatment. Um, before I go all the way down the rabbit hole with all of the questions that are spinning around in my mind, um, let's talk about brachycephalic ocular syndrome. Um, and I, I think this encompasses a lot of what you've been talking about, um, but is there more that we're looking for with brachycephalic ocular syndrome? Well, to put it into a nutshell, brachycephalic ocular syndrome is just simply um, caused by the skull shape. So it's a, it's a series of, of eye conditions that can happen as a consequence to the eye shape, okay. or the skull shape rather. So it does include, just to, if you were to put everything into one nutshell and say what does it encompass, it would be the shallow orbits, it would be the shortened maxilla, um, it would be the exaggerated eyelid openings, and then it would be tear film issues, so dry okay. eye. Um, and then decreased cor corneal sensitivity as well. So unfortunately, even though these dogs are exposed and dry and not able to you know, protect their eyes with their eyelids, they also then have a reduced blink, uh, corneal sensitivity. So it's like, well, holy smokes. Right, so they're not stimulated to even attempt to blink more right. and to lubricate and their eyes. And then you get problems, so you get in, they're at much higher risk for getting ulcers, so then they get an ulcer, and then what happens? They don't tell the folks and sure. the folks don't take them in. Oh, I didn't think about that. And then, yeah, and then you've got these corneal ulcers that are, you know, kind of behind the eight ball by the time anybody figures it out. Oh my goodness. I know. Uh, who are some of our primary offenders? Dr. McCall, I'll direct this one to you. When when it comes to our brachycephalics and, and brachycephalic ocular syndrome, who do we really need to be on the lookout for? I think we can all make some assumptions here. And how do we educate our owners about that? The first, I would say, pugs. Um, in one study, 100% of pugs had superficial pigmentary keratitis. Sure. I mean, they're all mostly going to get it. Um, and it can be blinding. And it is something that every general practitioner should look for during a pug exam. Look at the medial cornea, see if there's any little flecks of dark brown pigment forming in the cornea. Not just pigment, but um, superficial um, grayish cloudy scar tissue that may be coming in. It'll come, it's both eyes, it'll start the inside um, uh, medial cornea and then travel and go across in a strip um, axially and then it will spread out from there and fast forward about seven, eight years and the entire cornea often is pigmented except for a little crescent moon down below. That's clear, but every, so if this dog was going to see, it would have to look up like this <laughs> to look down through those little crescents, which is really, really sad. And, and so many times we'll see rescue pugs that are older and their corneas, they, they look like black velvet mm -hmm. because there's so much pigmentation. And what do we do? The answer is uh, medial, as Dr. Ford has said, is medial canthoplasty surgery. Um, the pugs um, are having this issue not only because of poor blink, but because of hair in the inside corner of the lids. They have um, medial entropion, particularly of the, of the medial ventral lid. There's just like a fat little lid. There's just fatty tissue all in there. I consider it, when you look at the inside corner of a pug's uh, eyelids, 
I call it crowded real estate. <laughs> it's crowded real estate. There is so much in there and there's not enough room and this fatty tissue has to go somewhere so it rolls in and the hairs rub on the cornea. Oh, you got to think about pugs is they can have dystochiasis. And when they have dystochiasis, it's stiff dystichia that are also irritating and can rub on the cornea. Because um, there's some breeds of dogs that when they have dystichia, it doesn't do anything. You don't need to remove them. And a prime example of that is Cocker Spaniels. Okay. They have lots of dystichia, but it's fine and soft and silky, and it's not really a problem. Where are we going to find those? Dystichia, um, dystichia are the uh, little tiny hairs that, they're, they're abnormal, that can grow out of the meibomian gland orifices on the upper and lower lid, but it's mostly the upper lid. The condition's called dystichiasis. And um, uh, so usually there's more than one hair coming out of an orifice. So it's almost like having a little paintbrush coming out of each orifice. And it can, if it's stiff, and, and, uh, and then it's irritating, yeah. more than irritating. And, um, but if it's fine and pliant and silky, um, like in cockers, then it's, it's not. It's, it's, it's not typically a problem. Um, so besides pugs, uh, English Bulldogs, they also get severe dystochiasis. Um, while the other thing about English Bulldogs is that they have very thick eyelid skin. It's, it's difficult to do. You can dull your scalpel blades doing entropion surgery and, and various plastic surgeries on Bulldogs. They have severe dystochiasis too. But Bulldogs, they're kind of a, a mixed bag because you can have ex you can have uh, brachycephalic ones with prominent eyes. You can also have ones in which uh, there's, the skin is so thick and there's so much of it that the eye is actually enophthalmic and it's recessed. And those dogs have trouble too because their skin's so thick, it will, the upper lid will, will weigh down and you'll get ptosis or drooping of the upper lid. The lower lid will, you know, can roll in. You have entropion, and um, with those dogs, then you can also. It can, the severest type of that is when you have what's called either pagoda lids or a diamond eye, where that's what the shape of the palpebral um, opening is. Is there's a notch up above centrally and a central notch below, rolling in on either side in the lower lid, and in the upper, um, it's the, the eyelashes are drooping down and rubbing on the cornea. Plus, um, bulldogs um, are, are the dog we really think of as far as dry eye. They really tend to have severe dry eye. Um, uh, more so, actually, than I, as far as tear production, bulldogs tend to be one of the worst ones, breeds for that. Shih Tzus. Shih Tzus, one study has shown that 82% of Shih Tzus have lag ophthalmos. They don't blink. Really? 82%. And when you look at a, the op lid opening on a Shih Tzu, you can take, with your fingers, you can make that go really big, <laughs> really big. And to the point where this is the kind of dog that their eyes really can fall out of their head. I mean, autoproptose, I don't know if that's a word or not, but <laughs> it is now. I think <laughs> it is now, <laughs> autoproptose. I mean, um, it is amazing. And, one of the really interesting things that about Shih Tzu, about, about dog, there's, there's this physical thing where if the eyelid openings, let's say they're big already, macropalpebral, let's say they're big already, and then let's say they're enlarged, if magically they are enlarged, for every 10% enlargement, lengthening of the eyelid margins, your risk of getting a corneal ulcer in these dogs goes up three times by oh. a factor of three. Shih Tzus and Pugs are the two breeds, I would say, that are the most commonly have um, medial canthoplasty surgery. Yeah. And with Shih Tzus, um, I, I consider their eyelids as like hairy armpits. I mean, <laughs> I love this. really, real you estate, feel, hairy you, armpits. well, you flip their lids and, and look at the bimbomian glands, and a lot of times what you will see, you'll see ectopic cilia, you'll see dystochiasis, you'll see if you get used to what meibomian glands look like, rolling, everting the lids and looking at those glands, those little white stripes going all the way um, across the lid, there's like 20 to 40 of them on each lid. They're important and they should be uniform and you know, next to each other like sardines, but in, in Shih Tzus, um, they very commonly have meibomian gland um, dysfunction and uh, dropout, atrophy, they're 
you know, they, they're plugged first and then the gland's plugged and, and not able to secrete its stuff, eventually it's going to just atrophy because it's okay. not able to work. Um, but um, they're also really prone to ectopic cilia. And this is the one breed in which, you know, usually dogs are done with having any ectopic cilia they're going to have by the time they're maybe a year and a half old or so. What do you think? Yeah, three. Uh, maybe three. Maybe. Shih tzus, they almost never stop. I mean, you can, I, I have had many Shih Tzus in which I had to go in and do, remove more ectopic cilia for like three times wow. until they're like eight, seven, eight years of age. They, they grow hair. It's terrible. Wow. And the other thing about Shih Tzus is that they're really prone. Um, the lacrimal caruncle, which in us is that little bump on the inside corner of the eye. It's really prominent in humans. It's not as prominent in dogs, but still call it caruncle. Um, uh, some ophthalmologists have termed when they, they, when they grow hair, when these things grow hair, a hairy caruncle, which kind of rhymes, kind of nice, um, or a haired caruncle, but Shih Tzus really do this. They grow hair inside, inside, under the lid in there, and it comes out, and some of it, it can be really long. Some of you have probably, you've probably seen, the sh I, it just floats on the, it floats it. on the like, tear oh, yeah. film. Mm -hmm. And if it's, it, and the dogs, you know, seem to be okay with it, but really what else, what else can they accept? I mean, they have to accept it. Um, so that's not okay when that's there. And over time, it's gonna lead to corneal pigmentation, scar tissue, ulcer, irritation, rubbing. Keep in mind, all these aberrant hairs, dystichia, nasal folds, et cetera, is gonna make a dog wanna rub. Sure. Um, and when they rub, then they're gonna hurt themselves. You know, self-trauma, corneal ulcers. Some owners think it's really cute if their dogs uh, rub their face, scoot along the carpet. It's not cute. You know, they, there's grit in the carpet and they can get ulcers. And, uh, and some dogs like to wipe their, hairy dogs like to wipe their mouths after they eat on the carpet or against furniture. That's not okay. If a bug-eyed dog is, is, um, is wiping their mouth, it means they're really wiping their eyes. And then if it's a Shih Tzu, the eye will pop out and we'll it, have it all can. kinds of problems. <laughs> yeah, it can. So Shih Tzus are a big one. I love them, and I love pugs too. I really do. Um, French Bulldogs, um, they're challenging. Um, I, I think it's a moving target with French Bulldogs because they're, they continue, as they continue to explode in popularity, I don't think there's an end in sight with French Bulldogs. I think we're going to see morphing uh, changes in, into various things that that they are going to get. Um, it's the smorgasbord of anything that brachycephalics can get that a French bulldog is going to get because there's, there's such ballooning breeding sure. of it. Um, so right now I would say nasal folds, pigmentary keratitis, exposure keratitis, um, corneal erosions at a, at a younger age. Um, dogs that are just four years of age you know, are getting corneal erosions. Um, Pekingese, if they were more popular, they'd really be up there because most Pekingese have really bad nasal folds where the hair rubs on the cornea, just really bad folds. It makes me cringe to see them. And uh, let's not forget Persians. So oh, we're yeah. talking about cats too. So Persians, um, exotic short hairs, Himalayans, um, particularly Persians though, they have nasal folds that will rub. and. Um, uh, Persians are also really prone to blepharitis. I call it the Persian cat crud. I don't oh. know what you call it. <laughs> I don't but, call it that. <laughs> what? I don't call it that. Okay, well, I call it, well, <laughs> chronic blepharoconjunctivitis and, uh, and just all these coffee grounds stuff on their, on their eyes. And, and they have the same problem as what, what Dr. Ford has said about, you know, exophthalmic, it means the corneal sensitivity is decreased okay. with brachycephaly. And so they're not going to blink as well, and they're going to have more, more trouble. Um, all the hairy-faced breeds that I've described, um, you know, the Shih Tzus, for example, or Shih Tzu, you know, um, designer breeds that have Shih Tzu in them, all, all, they really, one of the things the owners um, are going need to, must do is get the hair trimmed around the eyes so that the, the owner can see the eyes from every angle side view, front view, top view. And if there's hair in the way and they cannot see the curve of the eye from the side 
or from the top, then that hair needs to go. No top knots on the top, no stragglers. Um, one of the reasons dogs rub their eyes is there's all this hair on their face and it needs to go off. They ought to have their hair trimmed every closely every, uh, I would say every four to six weeks. We could go on. Yeah, good. There's so and there yeah. there's ones that I think were kind of flying under the radar for me, like the the Shih Tzu's, uh, Um, but as soon as you said it, like the light bulb went on. I went, oh yeah, I've yeah. seen that. And then um, Pekingese, absolutely, with their long, flowing, silky yeah. butterfly ears. And, and those long, um, caruncular hairs as well. Sometimes they don't just stay on the cornea. Sometimes they flop over. Sure. And then they'll wick the te tears away. Mm -hmm. So they're not actually staying on the cornea. Oh. And that's what's contributing to these terrible tear stains of yeah. these dogs. And that's what really bothers owners. But you don't want to cut those little hairs because now you've got little spikes on the cornea. Oh. So you actually have to, that's when a medial canthoplasty helps because you take that caruncle out okay. at the same time. Sure. Yeah. The, the medial canthoplasty does so many things. Yeah, it's um, a good surgery. It, it, it shortens the lid so they blink better, but they will never blink normally. Okay. Because that loss of corneal sensation. Part of the reason we blink is we feel our eyes drying out. Mm -hmm. If we don't feel our eyes drying out, we're not going to blink. Right. So if they don't feel that, they're just not going to blink as well. But it also, it will remove all those hairs and their follicles mm -hmm. um, from the caruncle. It will correct the uh, medial entropion, and if the owner, keep in mind some owners, they love those nasal folds. They want them. They don't want you to remove them. I mean, there is a way to remove like half the nasal folds, so there's still a little bit for the owner to be happy. Um, and I try to do that when, yeah. you know, if, if I feel it's okay. But, but the other thing it does, by zipping up the inside corner of the lid, then it, it, it protects the cornea from the nasal fold. Right. Because it's, does that make sense? It does, it does, right. yes. And I know that like cringing feeling of when you can see the fold like yeah. going up over the lower lid and you're like, yeah, oh The hair no. touches. But the good yeah. thing to know about the medial canthoplasty is that initially after the surgery, they, they do look a little bit like a lizard. They're more pinched down nasally, so they look a little funny. And people love the big, wide, open yeah. eyes. So they do actually round out over time. It takes a few months, okay. but they will become round yeah, again, but they, won't be, but they won't be entropic when they roll out. Okay. So you've, you've killed a number of birds with this one procedure, which Absolutely. is really, and they'll, they'll go back to looking like their cute selves. Sure. Yeah. So you still have a cute Just, puppy? Yeah. Not quite as cute. Yeah. But you don't want to change them. That, <laughs> you don't want to change them completely. They are. Yeah. They have their, their moments. I mean, they yeah. are cute dogs. They are cute, which is why they just unfortunately have a lot of problems that go with that cuteness. So along those lines, I think we've touched on a lot of them, but complications of brachycephalic ocular syndrome. So we've talked about pigmentary keratitis and, um, you know, corneal ulcers. And um, Dr. McClough, you mentioned corneal erosions, which it sounded like was a distinction from corneal ulcers. Is that correct? Um. A corneal erosion to me, and different ophthalmologists have different spin on this, is you're missing epithelium. You're missing the corneal epithelium. Okay. Okay. And corneal ulcer, you can also say, is a type, or erosion is a type of corneal ulcer. Okay. But what I, what I would prefer to say is that when I think of an ulcer, I think more of it involving the stroma. Okay. Okay. The stroma of the cornea, the meat of the cornea so to speak. Corneal erosions, I think, are, uh, are, are really common in dogs that, that, rub, that rub their eyes. It's a lot to think about. So corne corneal erosions, which sound terrible, corneal ulcers, which sound worse, um, pigmentary keratitis, mm -hmm. um, what, what other auto, autoproptosis, this word we have invented. <laughs> yes, it's um, a new word. I um, love this. <laughs> what, what other types of complications should we be aware, aware Reduced of? Reduced blinking. Um, um, yeah, lag, lag ophthalmos leads to so many different things. It actually leads to dry eye. Okay. When, when we blink, blinking is what makes, the act of blinking makes the meibomian glands release oil. Okay. So if you're not blinking, the oil's not coming out. The oil's not coming out, it gets inspissated and thick in the gland, and it won't come out. The gland, the orifice can get clogged. Where you see these little white heads. You got yeah. it. You got it. Yeah. And uh, there is a term for that that I didn't know. Why don't you, my bomian. My bite, my bite. <laughs> my bomeitis. No, Say that. My, oh, the doming. Oh, doming. Yeah, yeah oh, we call okay. it my bomian gland doming. Okay. Okay, yeah. sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, the doming. You know, so it's just these little, little caps on the yeah. Yeah, yeah. on the orifices. Sure. Yeah. And um, if the gland's not being used, it's going to go away. If you don't use it, you lose it. Okay. And so that happens. So it's called meibomian gland dysfunction. That happens with every animal or person that isn't blinking. The next thing I wanted to ask you about was corneal ulcers um, and, and diagnosing them and treating them. I think you know many of us are familiar with performing a fluorescein stain, but there can be nuances to that. So tips and tricks for making sure we get a diagnostic stain. Yep, absolutely. Um, first thing first, history. You've got to get a thorough history on these dogs. It's so important to know What's their activity? What's their daily, what turns their crank? In other words, what could have caused the ulcer in the first place? It makes a difference to how you're potentially gonna treat them. Um, we wanna know, we wanna be able to do a very detailed examination, preferably with magnification, so you can see the subtleties. And then when you're getting into staining, we wanna be, before you stain them, you wanna check their tears, unless there's a reason not to. He's extremely painful, or you already have a history of low tears. But typically I like to know whether or not there's a tear issue going on. Um, and certainly, if you can't get it in the eye that's got the ulcer, I at least get it in the eye that doesn't have an ulcer. So fortunately they have two in most cases. Sure, <laughs> and, and dry eye is often a bilateral disease. It doesn't have to be in some cases, but for the most part it is a bilateral disease. So if you've got low tear production in the fellow eye and normal tear production in the ulcerated eye, it could be because he's painful and tearing more as a consequence right. for the little few tears that he does is able to actually make. Um, as far as the actual staining goes, I like to take a tear strip stain and dilute it out with physiologic saline. And then I like to apply it quite wet to the dorsal conjunctiva as opposed to right onto the cornea. If you have a cornea, even a healthy cornea, but especially a cornea that's got some damage to it from having low tear production, wherever you place the strip, if it touches the cornea, will create almost this, it's an iatrogenically formed, perfect squared edged ulcer. And it's like, huh. That's an odd looking ulcer. Sure. So it's important that you don't create that because it will mess you up and you'll go, well, should I treat them? Shouldn't? It'll leave some uncertainty. So I like to apply it to the dorsal conj. Then I apply some physiologic saline or move the lids over the surface just to allow it to spread evenly with the, with the tears that he does have. Um, we always end up still doing tonometry on these fellas because even with um, corneal ulcers, when they're painful, it can result in a lower intraocular pressure. So you sort of keep that in mind. Um, we will, in the cases of deep ulcers, do something called a Seidel's test. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with those or not. It definitely rings a bell, right. but I cannot remember what that's I would do to do that test. That's okay. I, I love doing the Seidel's test. So you just put a lot of fluorescein stain on, add some saline, and then just stare at him with a blue light. And you're watching for if the cornea is so deep that it's leaking aqueous through it, you're going to find a little rivulet of darker fluid coming through a bed of green, which is the fluorescein, okay. because the darker fluid would be the aqueous coming through. And it creates a little rivulet, and you have to look at it with the blue light, but you'll see it. And once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. It's one of these things that you'll never forget seeing. And so I, I encourage when I'm teaching, to ch I show the students some YouTube videos on Seidel's test, and I'll tell you, once they've seen it, they go, I can handle this, and they can do it again down the road. So it's an important one to just double check if you're, if you're unsure if it's very deep. Um, and then the final thing, don't ever be afraid to consult a specialist. Sure. You know, if, if you're worried, a phone call is free, pick up the phone. I don't know of any ophthalmologists that actually say, oh, I don't want to talk to her. Referring to that. That's not appropriate. Um, so I think it's something to be encouraged and not to be worried about phoning or right. referring. That is really good to know, to say, you know, it's okay to refer these. Um, and just to be, a couple questions about the fluorescein staining and the deep ulcers in particular. Um, when you say put a lot of fluorescein in there, so are you taking this, are you dripping it off of the strip? Are you putting it into a syringe? Like, how are you getting all of this fluorescein well, into I typically, the Well, I typically don't try to put a lot on, honestly, when I'm looking for an ulcer. It's only when I'm doing the side else test. Right, I think that, sorry, that's what I meant, was with yeah. the side else So test. what I do is I just wet it with the, with the saline solution, with the little the little tip of the strip. Right. There's so much stain in those. Yes. You could swim, uh, you could stain a bathtub. I yes. mean, honestly, it's crazy. So I just literally drop it so there's a full drop that lands on the eye. That's really all you have okay. to do. Okay. And when you're staining for an ulcer, I just turn the tip, the, the strip, so that it's tip. And I just touch the tip, okay. the wettened tip right. to the surface. That's enough. Oh, and then you just watch it like. Well, and you just, it'll spread. Yes. And then you can rinse it off. And anything that sticks is into an ulcer because it only stays in the stroma.
And so if it's not picking up stain, um, that's when, is that when we're worried about those really deep ulcers? Oh, well, there's two times that you might not pick up stain. If it's very, very, very superficial um, irritation to the epithelium, so you're losing epithelial cells, that's when another type of stain called Rhone's Bengal may be handy. It'll show you roughness of the cornea. Okay. When you're putting fluorescein on and there's no staining, that's when, yeah, you do have to get pretty concerned because you'll often see the stain coming down the sides of an ulcer because there's still stroma there. Right. But then at the bottom, suddenly it's clear. It's like, hmm. That's no good. That can't be good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so is that when you would do the Seidel's test or you would I, do that I even would. on a more superficial one? No, I would probably reserve it for something I'm okay. really worried or if I'm unsure. Sure. Um, and so the, the clarity at the bottom is picking up on, the, it's the decimase membrane, right. which won't hold any of the fluorescein stain. Right. And so it's a concern when the center of the bottom is clear. It's like, oh, that yeah. can't be good. So yes, I would probably do a Seidel's test at that point. Or again, as I said, if I'm not sure of what I'm looking at, sure. just to make sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And if we are leaking aqueous, is, the, is that an automatic referral? It's an automatic advise to refer. Okay. Depends on where it's coming from, depends on the age, depends on the cause. But yes, I think it's appropriate to at least pick up the phone. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> at least make a phone call. And say, at least make a phone we call. Have a positive here. Yes, but I don't think any ophthalmologist would say, why did they refer that? Treatment recommendations for these corneal ulcers, whether they're superficial or deep or whatever we're looking at. There's there's a number of different treatments, and I'll sort of start the, the ball rolling and then Terry will take over, but um, we typically will start with topical and or, well, typically topical antibiotics. Um, and then sometimes we'll add in some orals as well. So there's some good ones. Oral doxycycline comes through the precorneal tear film, which I love. So it's okay. always bathing the eye. And then I like to start with um, a corneal, a topical as well. Now, the difference between the topicals comes in the viscosities. Right. So you can have an ointment or you can have a gel or you can have a drop. And it really depends on how deep the ulcer is. And sometimes it just depends on how comfortable the owner is. Sure. So if you have an eye that is at risk for rupturing, you only want to go with drops. Right. Because if it ruptures and some of that drop gets inside of the eyeball, it's safe. If you have an ointment on an eye that's going to rupture, sometimes the base of that, that ointment is not safe for the inside of the eye, and you can get a really terrible uveitis. Okay. Um, but if you have a dog who, for example, is incredibly aggressive and the owners can only do the dog once a day, they will probably choose an ointment. If they're so aggressive, and, and also an oral as well, but if, if they're really aggressive and there's a cornea that potentially could perforate, then sometimes they have to come in and have subconjunctival injections of antibiotics, so it's almost like a depot injection done, or have surgery done. Sure. Tricky. Um, the other things we really want to do with these fellows is lubricating them is great even with corneal ulcers, and it's preferably with hyaluronic acid. Okay. And again, they come in various forms, gels, drops, ointments, and the concentration changes as the, as the um, product increases in viscosity. So the drops that contain, the Optivet, for example, is a 0.18 solution percentage of hyaluronic acid, and then the gels are a 0.2, which is, these are all great concentrations, and then the ointment is a 0.4, which is really high. And the higher the viscosity, the longer they're going to stay on the eye. Because okay. don't forget, you're blinking it away. It's not like you're putting on a cream on your skin that's just going to sit there. Right. You're always blinking these things away. So the, the higher the viscosity, the longer it's going to stay. Artificial tears are not all created equal. Not at all. Um, you need artificial tears that have something that mimics the mucin. Right, that Velcro okay. layer. Right. And hyaluronic acid is the best one to do that and you need artificial tears that has lipid in it. And so you have something that will help take the place of that. And so um, there are products that have those things. And um, for, dogs, for dogs and cats, um, Decra has a gel. Um, and it needs to be preservative free too. Okay. But Decra has a gel that, that has hyaluronic acid in it. It has uh, phosphorylcholine, I think. That's a lipid, and so there aren't that many artificial tears that also have a lipid and hyaluronic acid in it, so it gets both, both sides to sure. that. Plus, of course, the, liquid, the volume, the, you know, the water, which is artificial tears have. So, um, so that's important for us, too. So you want to keep that sort of thing in mind. And then the last thing I'm going to touch on is the potential for um, melting ulcers. I love serum. 
<laughs> I love serum because it will stop the stroma license, the, the, the bugs, the enzymes that are chewing up the cornea. Okay. And so my favorite one is serum because the dog comes in with his own supply or you can keep it in the freezer. So yeah. it's always available to you. But there's a ton of products out there that you could purchase. The only downside to them is that you have to A, purchase them. They do have expiry dates and they cost something. So I'm big on serum because it does just as good a job. Sure. So that's what I'm going to say. Absolutely. And, and <laughs> yes, and I've always liked it because, you know, even if you have this little teeny dog where you're like, ah, I don't want to try to draw this much, no. but you probably have another dog. Well, in you know, if, you, if you're if you a general P, uh, GP vet, you've probably done a r big Rottweiler recently for right. a neuter, right? Yeah. They're healthy. They come in with their huge supply. You can harvest some of their blood. And I'm only talking 100 mils. I'm not talking about draining them. Sure. You harvest that up. You you. Reward the owner, like ask their permission and reward them. Starbucks cards go a long way. And then you can spin it down and you can make up tons of one mil syringes to yeah. dispense as needed. So you keep them in the freezer for several months and then you just keep renewing your supply. As opposed to guarantee four o'clock on a Friday afternoon Always. when half your staff is gone, it's a little teeny tiny Pekingese that's gonna kill you. The eye is about to rupture. You go to do his jugular vein and you perforate his eye. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's it takes yeah, about an hour and a half yeah. to, to collect and spin and get it all going for the owners and then teach them. Meanwhile, the owners are crying. Yeah. You've got no staff. The poor dog has been waiting. All Instead, all you do is go to your freezer, grab, dispense. Get a cold one. Easy. Get a cold one. <laughs> peasy. <laughs> Easy peasy. Absolutely. No, that, and that is good advice because, uh, yes, right. I think many of us. There's can no excuse to not have it. Right? At four o'clock. I've definitely been there more than once. So, so have I. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. McCullough, do you want to add to the, the treatment discussion? I want to talk a little bit about serum, okay. too. Um, so, 12 mils of blood, you can get 5 mils of serum. You can use um, dog serum on cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. okay. um, for cats, do not save serum from one cat and then give to another because there are so many diseases yeah. that you don't know that cat might have. Sure. Um, I once, my own cat, I used, this is years ago, but I used my own cat, house cat, because um, I thought my cat was healthy, you know, yeah. as, a, as a blood donor for serum for cat. Sure. Son of a gun, um, the cat came up with being feluc positive. Oh no! Really? Yes. Oh and my I'm like, goodness! I just, so, I don't think any cat. I I know none of the cats um, got it, but my gosh, you just don't know. Yeah, you that's You just a good don't example. know, and so there's tests. There, I think cats have diseases we don't even know about. That, <laughs> we don't even know they exist. Been identified <laughs> yet? <laughs> Probably true. Um, um, the other thing about serum is that um, it must be refrigerated when it goes home with the owner. Sure. I dispense them as one mil syringes frozen. And I tell them to take, the, I send it home with ice packs. So I store it frozen in my clinic, send them home with ice packs, tell them to put it right into the freezer. Then when they want to use a syringe, they take it out, hold it in their hand, thaw it, use it like a dropper for the one mil syringe with a cap, not a needle, and then put it in the fridge for three days. Okay. By then they've probably used it up after three days, but if they haven't, pitch it after three days, take another one out of the freezer. Okay. Simple. Makes sense. Makes sense. Good Easy. idea. Yeah a good method. Oh, and the last thing is that for a long time I had access to a horse, so I would use horse serum. For dogs and cats? Oh yeah, got yeah. a yeah. ton of it. Yep. They and come with a supply. They come it. with a supply. Yeah, and the great. good thing is you don't need an auto, uh, a centrifuge for that. You just draw it, you put it in the red top tube, it clots, you get perfect separation, there you go. Really? Awesome. <laughs> so instead of having like clinic cats and clinic dogs, we need a clinic horse. There you go. Everybody. Yes, horse <laughs> serum. For it. Let's do it. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so um, other other things to consider with corneal ulcers. Um, I also want to mention for the doxycycline, the reason we're using doxycycline is because that also helps stop collagenase right. activity and melting the cornea. It's not so much antibacterial as it is helping to stop corneal melting, and it's, it's a great drug. Um, pain control, um, a cycloplegic, so you want something that will stop the ciliary spasms of a ciliary body. That's very painful, so you want to use atropine, except there are some dogs in which you might not want to use atropine. For example, a dog that you know, um, let's say it has glaucoma in the other eye, and you're worried that th this eye is also predisposed to glaucoma. Well, you could go light 
and instead of using atropine, you could use tropicamide. It's not going to last as long because um, a drop of atropine can last seven days. Sure. You know, particularly if it's a heavily pigmented iris. Um, so you could consider tropicamide instead. Um, and then uh, systemic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is a good idea. They're not all equal. I myself like meloxicam. I think it's better for visceral pain, and I think eye pain is visceral pain. I don't think uh, carprofen or um, uh, what's the other galloprant? Sure. They don't they don't work as well okay. for eye pain, in my experience. Meloxicam does, and plus I really like with meloxicam that I can really it's with the liquid suspension, which is what it is for veterinary, is I can dose the tiny dogs. Right. With it, I can precisely dose the yes. tiny dogs. Not no rounding errors. Uh -huh. Right. Also, systemic um, opioids, buprenorphine, um, sometimes codeine instead okay. of buprenorphine. You know, I, you, you, these dogs are really painful, really, really painful, and you want to break that pain cycle. Um, also, consider uh, a fentanyl patch as a possibility. And um, Dr. Ford, you mentioned methadone. Before. Yeah, we methadone, buprenorphine, I, I like those as well. Um, but I have one other point about the atropine as well. So the atropine, which is dilating, it actually is more comfortable to be dilated. So when you look at the sun and your iris goes completely shut, it's not that it hurts to look at the sun because your retina is having a hole burned in it. It's because your iris is having a charley horse. And so by relaxing them, they're actually a lot more comfortable and they can relax more. They'll eat better. They feel better. They heal better. Sure. So that's one point. The second point is we don't usually use atropine in cats when they've got ulcers. It runs down the, down the nasal lacrimal ducts. They lick it. Yes. They start to froth it's and terrible. foam. Yeah, they, it's so bitter that they look like they're having a seizure Thank and the you. owner will call you and say, You're, my cat's dying because of what you just gave him. And it's like, calm down. It's just that they taste awful. So that we don't use that. We use madriacil or tropicamide instead. Okay. And then the third point that I think is really underestimated, we never tell people this, um, but I only tell it people now because I did it to myself, is after applying atropine to their pet's eyes, you, they'll often have a little drop on their hand. Okay, so it dries, no problem. But then later in the day, they'll rub their eye. Yeah. Now they're dilated. Oh, and when you're dilated, you can't focus. No. And that can last for a long time if you don't have inflammation that is actually countering. And so I always tell owners to wash their hands. And they, it seems like such a silly thing to, to it's like an obvious no-brainer. But when you don't realize you've got it, and then by accident you touch your eye, it's a problem. Yeah. And, and if you can't drive to go to work, that's a huge problem. Yes. Right? Yes, and I heard, I have heard that. Yeah, is, is that in humans it can last for quite a long time. It can last for ages. This is why when you go to the optometrist, they use tropicamide. Right. Because it only lasts for about four hours. But if you've ever been dilated, you know you can't, you can't do anything. Right. Right? No. You can't focus on anything. Oh, it's miserable. It's miserable. So this is a good thing to remember to tell owners. Absolutely. The other thing about atropine is that applying it to one eye, you know, it will cause dry eye temporarily, but it will also, applying a drop in one eye will make both eyes dry. It's oh. systemic. I know. Isn't that weird? That is weird. So, yeah. so if you're using that. atropine in, in one eye, and this is in particular a brachycephalic dog, or the dog's already been diagnosed with dry eye, then you want to step up the lubrication on the fellow eye. Sure. Um, now, systemic steroids, depending on the case, you could consider that, but I, I frankly like NSAIDs better, um, meloxicam, because I think it's better with pain. Okay, do we worry about um, systemic? I know the systemic NSAIDs are okay for, you know, we're not going to worry about that causing melting. What about systemic steroids? I don't worry that much because okay. it's it's topical no. steroids okay. that I forgot what the factor is, but it's 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 a huge dose of steroid to the as far as the cornea is concerned, topically versus systemically. Okay. So okay. no, I don't worry about that. But just um, the pain control. But what I would worry about is um, just potentially delayed healing overall, with a yeah, in someone in a, in a dog that's. Um, uh, that's let's say a dog's already been on, has been on chronic systemic steroids right. and now it's got an ulcer. Well, you can't switch it to NSAIDs right, yeah. right then. So that's a dilemma. So it depends on what the reason is the dog's on the chronic on the steroids for because you might have to continue it and you have to 
you yeah. know, even be just be even more aggressive. Hope for the best not, and be as aggressive. Yeah, yeah as nothing. You can. Not, Sometimes not have to do that. Most cases aren't by the book. Sure. Almost none of them. Let's um let's circle back around to hyaluronic acid, and you mentioned that playing a big role in you know adhering to the eye. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Hyaluronic acid is really important. It's a mucinomimetic, but it does so much more than that. And hyaluronic acid is big in skin products. It's big in eye products, and with this digital eye strain um, issue in, in people, uh, it's big in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, I, I can tell you. But this stuff is very slick, very, very, very slippery. And so um, also think about these poor bug-eyed dogs. Not only are they having difficulty uh, blinking because of the anatomy, but if they have dry eyes, it's like sandpaper on sandpaper. And then it's really hard for them. There's no, fr the friction is there, yeah. so they can't close. So if you reduce that friction and make it slippery, it's gonna be a whole lot easier. And this is better than just plain mineral oil or, or petrolatum ointment. Um, what I mean by that is Decra, and Decra is the only one that has this, is, a, is an artificial tear ointment that has hyaluronic acid in it. And Dr. Ford had alluded to that, it's got 0.4% great stuff. Every brachycephalic animal at bedtime should have this ointment put in their eyes. Not just regular artificial ointment, but this stuff. And um, that includes cats too. Um, also during the day, hyaluronic acid, I would say gel or ointment, should be um, put in the animal's eyes. And they need to get used to this from puppyhood. Hyaluronic acid, it's, it's, it's high molecular weight glycosaminoglycans. Um, the long molecules of this mesh with each other, and so it's called a, a viscoelastic. It, it's self-cohesive. It sticks to each other. It's like the most, if you're piling up a Dairy Queen soft ice cream cone, you can just pile and pile and pile it. It's just amazing how it could stick together. Um, it supports wound healing. Um, it hydrates the cornea, it stabilizes the tears, it improves epithelial migration. Um, it's an antioxidant, so it's a free radical scavenger. And uh, it retains um, the aqueous and mucin in the aqueous layer of the tear film. I already talked about reduced friction of the lids. And um, enhances tear film stability, it's neuroprotective. It promotes corneal nerve growth. I mean, the stuff is great. So um, can't say enough about hyaluronic acid and um, it's, it's super important. Absolutely. I think um, that makes a lot of sense. All of these things that we were talking about being problematic and then hyaluronic acid really addresses a lot of those issues. And, and then at that concentration uh, to be able to, and, and I also like what you said about having these animals get used to having things put in their eyes because it seems inevitable that at some point we will have to treat the eyes for something. So they got to get used to it in puppyhood. Comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that every pug should be born with a tube of lube around their neck yes. and should be starting to be lubricated in puppyhood because it's inevitable that these dogs will get an ulcer in their lifetime. And if their very first exposure to any eye medication or any drop is with an ulcer, when they're, they're going to think the drop is the pain. Yeah. And therefore, getting unringing that bell is almost impossible. Right. So starting them off early, getting used to drops or ointments or both, it's just going to make everybody's life easier, including the dog. Because sure. I can't imagine how stressful it would be thinking you're being you're going to be getting pain on your eye from yeah. a drop every time and somebody you comes to you. Nose. You can't hold their nose yeah. to stabilize them, no. putting the drops in. Well, and they turn blue. Oh. Yes, they do. Yes, they, that <laughs> so, absolutely happens. Yeah, there are all kinds of problems. So it's the only way to get it's you know you're doing yourself a favor, you're doing mm. the dog a favor, and yes, you're putting a, a bit of lubrication in their eyes at bedtime. Well, so what? It's part of the routine. Right. The dogs get really used to it, and their corneas are happier. Yeah. And then you may not have problems. Okay, this is the new standard for reputable this breeders. Is, do they send them home with a tube of lubrication? Yes. <laughs> and they get their puppies used to it when they're yeah. with the breeder. Sure. Well, if they don't, it's an opportunity for the general practitioner to. To make that difference, absolutely, and get yeah. it on the right road. Yeah, at, at the first wellness check. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a fantastic talk. I've learned a lot, as I always do when I talk to you. So, any final thoughts you want to share with us about brachycephalic ocular syndrome? Um, yeah, um, I'll, I have a few. One, besides lubrication from puppyhood, um, the owner really should have preservative-free saline at home, a preservative-free saline eye wash to use if they ever need to rinse the eye. 
Um, we don't want topicals that have benzalkonium chloride. I don't remember if I mentioned that before, but avoid that in, if possible, in anything you put on your dog's eye because it's toxic to the surface of the eye and it screws up the meibomian glands too. Um, have a pre-fitted e-collar at home for that dog. You never know when it's going to need it, so have the owner get that. You might need different sizes as this puppy grows, but you know it, it, it should put the fear of God into the owner. Um, they put out a lot of money for this dog probably, and so they should, besides buying all the puppy toys, they, they need to get these things too. Um, think about the hazards like landscaping. If there's a thorny bush outside, this dog's going to find it. Okay, And don't use wire brushes around the face. I once saw a pup, Shih Tzu puppy that the owner had been using a wire brush to run the, the puppy Wiggly. It impaled the cornea, and the wire went into the lens and needed cataract surgery. Oh my goodness. And the owner felt terrible. But you know it wasn't oh. planned. And the haircut on the hairy dogs every four to six weeks, short. That's mine. <laughs> um, what to add? I think, um, to be honest, I think daily monitoring, just look at your dogs. Yeah, you know, if it means taking a cell phone, yeah. can, like the light on your cell phone, just quick little look, putting them near the kitchen window, just watch for changes, increased or persistent anything. Squinting, tearing, redness, rubbing, but squinting especially is really important. And physical changes, are you seeing the corneas getting browner? Are you seeing more of a mucky discharge? These are all really, really important in those breed, the brachycephalics, more than any other breed, I would say. And then minimize risky behavior if you can. Now, we don't want our dogs to live in a box, we know that. But at the same time, if you have the option of perhaps choosing a toy that when they whip it with their head, which is not a great activity, that it's not going to, if there's a ball on the end of it, gonna whip around and hit the other eye, nah, it's probably better to choose the one that doesn't do that. Um, and then play fighting as well. You know, their eyeballs are not being held on by very much more than their eyelids, in which case when you've got two dogs who might be play fighting a little aggressively and they just even pull on their neck or their ear, it's enough to move the lid. Or this oh, kind. Gosh. Or this kind. Oh, I know. This kind of play. Sure. Not yeah, good. shadow boxing. Yeah. It's um yeah, that's really that's really it. Or start early. Monitor. Sure. Yep. Yeah, and th I think those are really powerful messages to take home and then also good messages for the general practitioner as far as what to yeah. educate our clients about at these puppyhood visits. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This has been fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you to DECRA for partnering with us for this edition of Vet to Vet. Check out NAVCsVetfolio.com for more of our V2V -V discussions on various topics in veterinary medicine. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.